I am the last hope of my race. We stand on the precipice of annihilation, a grim circumstance for which I believe my father is to blame. Though I do not resent him, for he chose in accordance with the will of his subjects, but we have harmed her children, and so with great breath she will carry them from the Elderwood across the Sea of Ghosts, and she will unleash a widow's grief upon our shores. Despite what our honoured say, a night of tears was not the right response to the founding of Sarthal. For they would not witness the snow turn scarlet or smoke smother stars, nor would they hear the screams of mothers silenced by the pull of steel. We had slaughtered the children of the sky, and so it was inevitable that a storm would come. For a time the king's court and his circle of prelates were at peace. The architect's eye had slipped from the hands of the foxes chosen, and the purity of our snowed land was restored. All was well in our northern domain, until the inevitable return. When news of this came to me, I was residing in my fortress, Nerilla Alaxon, its structure simple and stern, nestled into the side of the Mosering Mountains, standing vigil against the heretics of the east. The messengers said that Isgrimor had returned with his five hundred, wielding a storm-made axe forged with tears of pure ebony, Lorcan's blood. He had come with songs of slaughter, their terrible voices swallowed entire villages and threw them into the sea. Our treasured realm was in disarray because of only five hundred. What are my father's orders? I asked. The messenger began with condolences and before a sentence was strung, I knew. My father had been killed, torn asunder by violent echoes. They did not bring me the details of my mother's death, and nor did I want them. Our people would now meet the penalties set upon them by the actions of their now departed lords. I alone, the Snow Prince, will lead the Falmer, children of Oriel, in a campaign against the tides of fate. I sent my captains to rally the soldiers, and I called upon my servants to gather my war gear. I walked forth from the throne room, headed towards the armory as my retinue followed, pleading to have their particular advice heard. Call upon the Dereni! These demons are at our doorstep! Calm yourself, there are but five hundred. May I remind you that these mere five hundred have brought death with their every blighted step on this land. Look at the skies, you damned fool, they grow black and sickened! We must flee, sire. Head south. The king of Sador loved your father and will surely provide refuge. Their pleas fell on deaf ears as I moved, gathering my silken white hair, tying it into a top knot. My mind was clear. There was no other way. We may think ourselves masters of our destiny, beings of free will. This is not true. It is an illusion. Gods, kings, Past versions of ourselves with which we no longer identify. It is their actions that create the circumstances of today. I did not choose this world as I did not choose the purge of Sarthal. Oriel made his mind. The flow of time is forwards, and I will follow to the end. I reached the armory, and three reekling attendants clattered around me, equipping me with a panoply of brilliantly polished moonstone plates. My chamberlain presented me with my spear, a beautiful craft gifted to me by the artisans of the Western Chantry. Its bite is cold, and even the finest steel armor folds around it as it pierces. Yet I am told the Atmorans dress lightly, if at all, and that their painted skin is what protects them. Children's tales, I think. Days had passed, and they had not come. Our soldiers stationed to the walls at all times, and the people of nearby villages had been sheltered within the fortress. Scouts were sent forth at my command, yet none returned. In the distance, sickened clouds of black hung ominously above every village that burned in the distance. My heart urged me to ride out and save my subjects from the retribution of man, undeserved fates at the hands of a bloodied axe, yet I could not risk fighting on their terms. It was bait. For weeks, thunderous shouts and screams forced their way into our ears. The nights were sleepless, and in the dark, the horizon became a starscape of burning hamlets. 
A month had passed, and at dawn they had finally marched to our walls. We had the advantage of high ground. Our archers were atop the walls, and heavily armoured warriors of white formed columns of death-dealing spears, supported by ranks of frostcasters. We outnumbered them threefold, but my father's army outnumbered them ten, so I would not be rash. The Northmen stood at the foot of the slopes, chanting and stomping, a fear-mongering tactic, or so I thought. Suddenly, impossibly loud booms sung from their throats and the mountain shook. The eastern wall crumbled, taking the archers with it. Small avalanches washed over half of my soldiers, sleeting snow dragging them into the moors of the axe teeth below. The Atmorans charged upward, painting strokes of crimson across snow canvas as steel bit into the necks of elves. Their penchant for slaughter was uncanny. I wondered then if the stories would tell of their demon screams and unbridled bloodlust. I doubt it. Axemen charged into the crack of the eastern wall, and they would have been surprised to find that there were few within. I sat upon my steed of pallid white, disguised in a cloak of magic illusion. None could see me or my vanguard. At the opportune time, I rode onto the battlefield, revealing myself and my elite. The other soldiers cheered my name and professed the coming of the Atmoran's doom. The Northmen were silenced as they gazed upon the radiant glow that shone from my armor, stupefied as my horse galloped upon inches of snow as if it were solid ground. The battlefield was still. My soldiers' cheering had stopped. Everyone knew. Death was upon us all. Today, tomorrow, or ten years from now, it would come. I raised my spear to the sky and hell broke loose once more. I launched into the fray, the point of my spear skewering neck, chest, or spine. Snowflakes coalesced around me and whirls of snapped winds brushed over my enemies. The cold did not harm them, and so I summoned spears of solid ice and sent them into their hearts. Ulfgi Anvilhand, Strom the White, Freyda Oakenwand, Heimdall the Frenzied. For hours I carved my way through the mightiest of their heroes, but still the tides of fate crept closer, and our army was diminished. We were a mere twenty against three hundred. If I were to meet the gods this day, then I would do so filled with courage and showered in glory. I rallied my soldiers for one final charge, for with their snow prints, victory was still possible. In a blitz, I surged into their line upon my steed, lunging spear at the first enemy I saw. A warrior woman lay dead, with but a child draped over her corpse. What kind of people could let a child bear witness to the woes of war? I turned my attention to my next kill. The tip of my spear pierced right through his helmet and nestled within his skull, and suddenly, I felt it. Something wrong. My spear slipped from my hand, my fingers went limp, and I did not know why. I turned and only saw the shocked faces of both my remaining soldiers and the Northmen. My chin dripped warm red and I looked down. My cuirass was cracked and a sword stuck in my chest, buried to the hilt. There she was, the child, a girl of no more than twelve, staring with hateful eyes, sat in a tear-glazed face. A child. It was her. She killed me. She threw it. I gripped the hilt of the sword and tried to pull it out, but it was in that moment fate had caught me. I slipped from my horse and felt an embrace far colder than snow.